happens when electrons are introduced to a magnetic field. So we said, okay, these electrons, they spin, they have a north and they have a south, uh, and they're creating a magnetic field around them. Um, so what we're going to look at first is electrons that are unpaired. So we said we have these filling diagrams, and sometimes we're left with electrons, like in this oxygen, or this one on the left is for iron. We're left with electrons that don't have an opposite spin. So this has one uh, moment up, a moment up, moment up, moment up. Uh, same with oxygen, we have it up and up. So we have these magnetic fields that are in the same direction. So when we have a material that has magnetic, or the electrons, they're not filled, they're unpaired, we have a direction for our magnetic field. They're not canceling each other out. We don't have a north and a south right next to each other, which would cancel. We have a bunch of magnets in a row or it's just kind of all over the place, they're all pointing in the same direction. Um, and then if we have electrons that are paired, nothing's really going to happen. Uh, we can create a magnetic field, but it's a little bit difficult. We need a really strong magnet because we have the north pole of the south, north pole of one magnet or one electron canceling out the south pole of the other one. So this is kind of just like, okay, I found where I want to go. My field lines are just going right here. I'm not creating this large net magnetic field. So really quickly, I, I found this resource, I kind of liked it. Um, so we see, okay, when we have unpaired electrons, like in this case, oh no, it's freezing, that's okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, when we have unpaired electrons, we definitely have a direction to that magnetic field. So we have, hey, over here, the magnetic field is pointing upwards. We have that north going up, we have that south going down. And if we have a bunch of these atoms, we'll have a bunch of upwards pointing magnetic fields. We'll have this north dipole moment. Um, and then when we're unpaired, or when we are paired, kind of canceling each other out. We have this north, we have this south, they're canceling. So we don't really have any defined net dipole moment. So they're just canceling each other out. North and south cancel. We don't have a net dipole moment here. So this is huge, this is really important. So when we have these unpaired, the ones that can create a net magnetic field, uh, the first type we're gonna look at is ferromagnetic objects. So I'm just gonna read this because this is like the AP definition. But so ferromagnetic objects or materials can be permanently magnetized by an external field that causes the alignment of magnetic domains or atoms or atomic, atomic magnetic dipoles. So it's when we introduce, and I'm going to pull it back up to here really quick. This is, oh, right, actually. So it's kind of like, in this case, let's uh, pretend we don't have the compass. When we bring, if we pretend that all of these little compasses are inside of an object, make this big so you guys can see me. Um, so if we pretend that all of these little magnets are electrons within an object, when we bring a magnet near it, these little electrons, or these little magnetic dipole moments, are aligning themselves with the field, with this magnetic field. So these little electrons will spin so that they're all pointing in the same direction, and they're attracted towards this north end of the magnet. So there's another simulation that I found that kind of shows this. So here we have this ferromagnetic material. We have these unpaired electrons that can move pretty freely. Uh, when we bring the magnet closer, those little electrons will start to align themselves with this field because they can spin and they don't have anything canceling the other one out. If we were to bring, if we were to be paired, we'd have the north pointing towards that south and then we'd have the other one that has the opposite orientation going the other way, and those would just cancel each other out. So because we have this unpaired, all of our electrons, their magnetic dipole moments are pointing in that same direction, and we create this magnet. We create a bunch of norths pointing this way, a bunch of, a bunch of souths pointing that way, and we have this strong magnetic field that gets created. So what's kind of cool with that, kind of extending that, we can think of a magnet as just a bunch of small little electrons all oriented in the same way, all facing the same direction. So all of these dipole moments 
pointing in the same direction, kind of like in this image that I drew that I'm not proud of. <laughs> um, and then what's kind of cool about that is I think somebody asked it in class, but like if we cut a magnet in half, we just create more magnets. We're not really messing with the orientation of those. We're just kind of cutting off where they're acting. So if we kind of cut our magnet right here, we would get uh, this north and south magnet acting in that direction. And then these are still acting in that direction. Uh, so we still have another magnet with defined orientation. So that's kind of neat, kind of cool, um, just kind of an extension of that. But so ferromagnetic objects, when you bring a magnet near them, those little dipoles will go towards the magnet and they will stay that way. They'll be like, yo, this is a great orientation. Love it. I'm going to stay just like that. In the same vein, we have paramagnetic objects. So they do the same thing. When a magnet is brought near them, they will align themselves, but it kind of ends there. As soon as we bring the magnet away, they'll go back to doing their own thing. So they're going to lose their magnetic property when that external magnet is removed. So ferromagnetic, it's going to stay aligned and it's going to become a magnet. But the paramagnetic, they'll be aligned when the magnet's here and then they'll kind of just do their own thing. They'll remain, uh, they will not remain aligned after the field is removed. Then the last one is diamagnetic. The way that this works is very confusing and I tried to look it up and I, I couldn't find a good explanation that was easily understandable. I'm gonna link a video by the, I think the brother of the guy who wrote Fault in Our Stars, like the green guy, whatever his name is. Uh, he has a good video. <laughs> um, but it still wasn't like, whoa. Um, it was still just kind of like, yeah, diamagnet diamagnetism, it exists. Um, so diamagnetism is cool because all materials have this property of diamagnetism um, that the electronic structure can create a weak alignment of the dipole moments of the material opposite to the external magnetic field. So you're gonna bring a magnet in and then instead of pointing, like if this was north over here, instead of the south pointing, it'll actually, turn the other way and then oppose it. And these are usually gonna be pretty weak and it's gonna be in objects that are non-magnetic and it's gonna cause our objects to repel. So instead of like paramagnetism and ferromagnetism, they line up in a way that we're used to, like a little compass would, this diamagnetic object is doing the opposite. Um, so it's gonna repel it. And pretty much every object, we say all material can do this. So what's cool is in this video, it's a little bit, oh, it's whatever. <laughs> it's just a little weird. But so what they do is they have this strong magnet and they say, well, frogs are made of a lot of water and water is a material and materials can become magnetic. So they create this strong magnetic field with a strong magnet and they kind of drop these frogs in here and then they can levitate these frogs. So these frogs are levitating because of magnetism, because they are diamagnetic and then they're repelling because we're bringing this strong magnet in here the dipole moments inside the frog are aligning in an opposite direction so that they will repel and then they can float this looks like a cricket or something or a grasshopper which is kind of weird and then they do like flowers which is much nicer yeah flowers <laughs> and then this dude's talking i don't know what he's talking about um <laughs> But yeah, so that's kind of neat. So that's a nice application of this diamagnetic. So anything can become magnetic, um, but things like ferromagnetic and paramagnetic are going to attract, and diamagnetic is going to be really weak, and it's going to repel. And then the last thing what we want to do is say, well, we talked about these different types of magnetisms. Why? Because uh, we want to figure out how guitars work. Uh, so a steel string, the electric guitars are steel strings, and they're made out of steel, which is a ferromagnetic object. So we have this ferromagnetic object that is brought near a magnet. These little, I don't, again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but these little circles are magnets. So we're bringing a ferromagnetic object next to a magnet. So we want to think about what those electrons are doing when they're brought near that magnet. So we want to think about that. We want to keep that in mind. And the last thing we want to do is I'm going to have you fill out a quick little Google form uh, thinking about how an electric guitar works. And I'll tell you, we kind of have the information we need in order to do that. It's going to be a little bit weird. We're going to have to work a little bit backwards. Um, but what we said before is kind of, hey, like, 
when we have a current and a magnetic field, uh, we create an electric force or a magnetic force. And then also the other one that I didn't post that is a little bit more important. When we have current, that current creates a magnetic field. Um, so we know we have like electric guitar, so current is somehow associated in there. We kind of have these magnets moving, I don't know. Um, so we want to think about how that happens, and that's what we'll get to on Thursday. So I know that today is a Wednesday. Uh, it's a little bit shorter, but I would say if you want to fill the full double period, uh, I would work on those AP Classroom problems too. So yeah, that's kind of what I got for today. Thanks for listening. Hopefully that wasn't too complicated. I'm also going to post the... Uh, Hank Green video, uh, which I think he does a better job than I could have, um, but he, he gets, uh, I get paid to do it too. He's just better at it. Um, so he's got good graphics and stuff, so I'll post that too, but this is kind of me going over it, but his is a little bit more like simpler and doesn't talk about moments, I think. I don't know. I didn't watch it that quickly or that closely, but yeah, so that's what I got. I uh, hope things are going well, and yeah. All right.